Our next session will build on uh, what we've heard so far uh, about the challenges of children's palliative care, um, about some commonalities with the adult world, um, and also with what Charles has told us about the need for building evidence uh, to support and inform practice. I'm really delighted to be able to welcome uh, Myra Bluebond Langner, um, who's come from University um, College London today. Again, we, we tried to find a date to come in a previous year, it didn't work out, so um, really pleased you're able to join us today, Myra, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you for the opportunity to take a rain check and come again. But most of all, thank you for the opportunity to tell you in word and an image about my hero, my dad. One of the reasons why my dad is my hero is the way he took care of my mom with Alzheimer's. Diagnosed with motor neuron disease, he presented with the end of the disease first. So his ALS affected his ability to speak, to swallow, and eventually to breathe. But he never lost the use of his limbs, his ability to bathe my mother, to put her to sleep at night, to see that she was well cared for. His last words, written on one of those magic slates, because my sister was environmentally conscious. You know, you had to write it and then erase it. Were, take care of your mother, Myra. And we all know what that meant. Pediatric palliative care is a relatively new field, which has, at its very core, not unlike its older sibling, adult palliative care, reducing suffering. As researchers and clinicians, we know that the suffering of these children and families is both derived from and exacerbated not just by the physical pain, not just by the agonizing decisions that mark the journey, and not even from the suffering that comes from having to confront the existential questions of what are we doing this for, but also just the daily living with all of it. What of the suffering that comes from the juxtaposition of the greatest responsibilities a parent can bear with the everyday tasks of cooking, cleaning, making school runs, and paying the mortgage. It is said that compassion is the response we make to suffering. What can we be doing to address the pain, the suffering, the choiceless choices these families make? Well, standing before you as a researcher, you wouldn't be surprised if I said, more research. Now, isn't that the way most articles end? Further research is needed on and I would be the first to say that more research is needed, but it needs to be the right kind of research done in the right way. So over the next 40 minutes, I want to outline a research agenda aimed at reducing suffering to identify what will be needed to complete that agenda. 
as well as the resources that we need to be paying attention to, policy documents, guidelines, and the like, as well as our experience with these families. I'd like you to note that while what I'll be talking about is children, I think, like Maria, there are things that might apply to adults. The diagnosis of a life-limiting or life-threatening illness is an assault on the child and family. Illness sets that child and family apart from others. Plans, roles, duties, obligations, priorities change as family life is interrupted by care and treatment. The disease becomes a menacing presence. It becomes an unwelcome but constant companion. Each consultation, each trip to the hospital, each to the hospice, each change in the child's condition serves as a reminder of the disease's unrelenting course and eventual outcome. At risk is not just the life of the child, but also the very life of that family. The role of the parent is complex. On the one hand, the parent is there to nurture, to protect. The parent is also there to advocate. How does a parent protect a child from a constantly dividing cell more powerful than any radiation or poison? How does one protect their child from the damage of continuous seizures? How does one deal with a child's breathlessness and decreasing lung function? How does one advocate for one's child when one doesn't speak medicalese, let alone English? How does one put your child's case forward when you don't even know the world you're in. A disease which may be fatal or permanently damage that child's ability to be in the world calls the parent's very nature, very ability into question. The illness also engages others in the triangle and brings their role into question. The clinician is the one who's supposed to cure. Well, that's really challenged. Seriously ill children who suffer, who deteriorate, who die, challenge the concept of the physician for the child as parents, as protector. Well, such children confound our notions of what it is to be a child. Being a child is to be someone with a future. And this is not lost on the children either. So perhaps it's not surprising that when they come together, they engage in mutual pretense. You know that drama. Everybody knows, but nobody's talking about it. Because the prognosis threatens the parent's ability to nurture, to protect. The clinician's ability to cure, even to heal sometimes and the child's responsibility to become, to grow up. However, through the practice of mutual pretense, each can act out their socially defined roles. So looked at in this way, mutual pretense is not just about concealing or denying. It's the means by which 
individuals protect themselves, protect one another and their responsibilities. Parents push back against the intrusion of the disease. They respond to the challenges while trying to preserve what they can of a normal life. Parents use several strategies to manage the tasks of care, to process information about the child's illness, to deal with the child's difference from others, to assess and address different priorities in the family, and to conceptualize a future despite the prognosis. The strategies allow these families to live with some modicum of normalcy, some sense of control. Now this very busy, very poor PowerPoint gives you an idea of what's going on and underscores what Professor Norman has said about things changing over time. So up at the top, you have various episodes in the illness. And here we see how families' responses change over time. Let me call your attention, for example, with this diagram to families of children with cystic fibrosis. When the child is doing relatively well, parents talk about the future. When the child is doing poorly, however, such conversations cease. Or, for example, when the child is doing well, information about gene therapy comes to the forefront of their minds and talk about transplant and the possibility of death goes to the back. There, not to be forgotten, but not to be the center of attention either. Families are constantly engaged in redefining normal. Now, as the child's conditions change, so too does the parent's view of their child. Before the child was diagnosed, the parents saw themselves as experts in how to take care of their child. They then receive a diagnosis. They're overwhelmed. Overwhelmed, the word that comes up over and over again. But you know what's interesting? They emerge from this period of being overwhelmed. And at points, come to see themselves as experts, experts in knowing what options are available, experts in knowing what options should be available, able to make suggestions. Or, in the case of well siblings, their views of the illness change. So in the case of cystic fibrosis, which involves a lot of care, in the home with postural drainage therapy, the sibling moves from a view of the disease as a condition one does things for. And my sister's just like everybody else. She eats some pills before she eats, and we pound on her chest a little bit. To a view of the disease as chronic, progressive, incurable that shortens the lifespan. Her chances of living are almost zero. Eventually, though, those qualifiers leave their view of death, their view of life with CF. 
and they see their sibling as someone who will die from this disease. I know her chances are almost zero. Everyone dies from this disease. Well, as their views are changing, their parents, who have been busy with various strategies, have the sibling within their range of vision or outside their range of vision. And the well sibling knows that. They move from the blue, clearly voicing their demands for attention, to be looked at, to be listened to, to keeping it quiet or having it come out in other ways. Well, given the situation in which children and families find themselves, what can we do to reduce their suffering? More specifically, from a research agenda, what should be on our agenda? I think we need to begin with better understanding of the illness experience. We need to deepen as well as increase what this illness does to the individuals and the families over the entire course of the illness from diagnosis through death. The work of Fraser and Hain in the UK and Fuchner in the United States points to the range of diagnoses that would fit on the palliative care spectrum. And in so doing, points to the range of experiences of children and families. Without knowing how this life is lived, we risk putting into place interventions and programs that won't work. We all know that decision making is a hallmark of the illness experience. As studies of advanced care planning and decision making about care and treatment show, Parents make all sorts of decisions for their children, even when they're well. What they wear, where they'll go to school, what time they'll go to bed, what they'll eat for lunch. How complicated does that become when your child is fed through a tube, when part of the bedtime ritual includes non-invasive ventilation? What happens when a cough escalates? What about the ICU? Assisting families in decision making is one of the primary activities of palliative care clinicians. Yet, what is their assistance in this decision making based on? Where's the evidence? on how to conduct these conversations. In our recently published study of parents' approaches to advanced care planning, we learned that parents want to keep their options open. They often say, I'll decide at the time, or I want everything. We need to know much more than we currently do about how parents make decisions and what they look like. What are they actually told about their child's illness? And not just from the disease-directed specialists, but from the community, from friends, from the internet, and not just one point in time, but over the entire course of the illness. 
In our recent studies of decision making when standard therapy has failed, and our studies of children with high-risk brain tumors, we found that parents' uptake and use of information is not necessarily the same as what clinicians would expect. Our current studies suggest that the prognosis is far more complex than has previously been thought, and we have found that there's absolutely no association between parents' understanding of the prognosis and what they choose to do. Well, why is this the case? And more specifically, and more concerning to clinicians, is why does the parent continue to look for and follow up on further treatment when time is so limited. Part of this difference in interpretation can perhaps be framed by saying that the parents have a different logic. As one mother said, I know people have the point of view. They look at me like I'm crazy, you know, because of the statistics. I know that, but he's been relapsed since February and he's over a year in relapse, and he's still here. How many have been in relapse that long? Parents use statistical information differently than clinicians used. Parents are uniquely bound to one particular child. Clinicians are looking at a whole population. Parents feel the burden of their choice will make a difference to their child's outcome. As one mother said, if I decline treatment for him, I have denied him that chance. The odds of a child responding to treatment or being cured are not determinative of parents' choices. Parents will accept infinitesimal odds because the prize they seek is of infinite worth. Continuing the search for disease-directed options is crucial to parents' definitions of themselves. Parents throughout the disease embrace both disease-directed and symptom-directed care. The dual pursuit is illustrated here and represents their dual roles that in some cases are contradictory to both protect and advocate. Parents' views and clinicians' views of that child are not necessarily the same. As one mother put it, he's a healthy, sick kid. <laughs> the parents' construction of a child are different and perhaps wider than the clinicians. As one mother whose child first diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor, 18 months treated with intensive chemotherapy radiation, developed leukemia at three years of age, treated with high dose chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant, relapsed, now had a fungal infection eating away at his nose, said, I want to treat him as if, okay, his disease is incurable. So we've heard that time and time again. He's still here with us. We don't know what's going. Yeah, we know his counts, we know that kind of stuff, but he's still here, he's still breathing. 
He goes to the mall with us. He plays video games with his sisters. I want him to be treated as if he's curable. I don't want him treated as if he's going to die. That's how I want him to be treated. I want everything in everybody's power that they can possibly do for Stephen till the end. The parental view may be driven by factors which the clinician cannot understand, but can feel. As palliative care practitioners, we also know the importance of pain and symptom management. We're supposed to be experts in that. But the published evidence is not very good. There's a dearth of evidence. We have a formulary that's based on experience. Pain and symptom management is, for many, trial and error. We need studies that will lead to better evidence-based management. What are the best pharmacological and non-pharmacological agents? For example, in our studies, we need to be mindful of what these interventions mean to parents. In our study of PCAs, you know, patient-controlled analgesia in the community, we learned that many families would accept suboptimal pain relief for the ability to be out and about. We need patient, parent-centered outcomes, not merely reported outcomes. Well, what is it to deliver services to these families? Are the models we have in place appropriate? Are they sustainable, given the number of children who would benefit from these services? Are there other ways of delivering services? In England, there are, according to Fraser and her colleagues, 40,000 children ages 0 to 19 with life-limiting conditions. In Scotland, in her study in 2014, there were over 15,000 individuals between birth and 25 who fit the definition. Some have suggested developing outpatient clinics. Well, can they work? Do we have the capacity? to devise them. Regardless of which models we need, regardless of which models we use, we need to be writing and better understanding what we write in our clinical notes. In our study to try to establish the incidence and prevalence of breakthrough pain, we had a problem using clinical notes. There needs to be better consensus on what's to be recorded and how it should be recorded. We need education. Not only in the palliative care sector, but outside of it in the worlds of pediatric oncology, neurology, neonatology, intensive care, and cardiology. We cannot achieve what these families want, which is a seamless integration of palliative care and disease-directed care without better integration. So as nice as conferences like this are, we're preaching to the choir. We need to get out there and be at the places 
where the disease-directed clinicians gather. As we pursue an agenda to, in, to reduce suffering, we must ensure that the work we do respects the complexity of what we're studying. This requires an approach to research that employs models that considers all of the stakeholders, the parents, the children, the clinician, and yes, the institutions of which they become a part. We need to get better at capturing the voices of children and their role and the role that they want to take in decision making. We need child-centered methods. We need ethnographic methods. We need to be doing, sorry, we need to be doing Hmm. Prospective studies. In decision making, we need on the ground embedded researchers in the clinic, in the consultation, in the hospice, audio recording the actual interactions as they unfold over time so that we can look at who said what to whom, better understand, as Professor Norman has suggested, what people need to make decisions and how they proceed rather than what they've told us they need they aren't necessarily the same. Reports from interviews will not suffice for the development of guidance on decision making. And neither will retrospective studies of bereaved parents, unless the study is about bereavement. For they too, are inappropriate for understanding the ongoing action. Part of the problem with studies of bereavement or using a bereaved population is that they're telling us the story that they've come to live with. In our systematic reviews, we, like the adults, have found that there isn't a great deal of evidence that home is universally preferred. Our methods must fit the purpose for which they are, are made. We need to use and develop toolkits for research that will work in home and community. We need to partner with other institutions, not just to do the large multi-site studies, but also so that we can increase our capacity we must be brave and willing to share our mistakes. And sharing mistakes isn't all bad. It earned us an editor's choice in the major journal in palliative care. But more importantly, this study about the potential of bias in our studies through physician gatekeeping opened up a whole new stream of research. Our work must reflect the diversity of the populations 
we care for. And by diversity, I don't just mean cultural or ethnic. I'll come on to that. But also the full range in pediatric palliative care, which includes newborns. Understanding the diversity of populations really came to light when parents gathered with clinicians, clergy, and ethicists to write a world charter on the world's religion, of, of the world's religions, and what patients and parents wanted. In that conference, it became clear that clinicians, clergy, ethicists, however well-intentioned, were not really listening to what parents want and need. In conclusion, we have a rather tall agenda. Yes, there are barriers to delivering that agenda. But we can achieve it if each of us does our bit. I look forward to our discussions. I'd like today to be a prelude, to act as an opportunity to think about ways that we can begin to bring together the considerable talent. Hmm. It's, gone. it's gone. That's like the end. Hmm. OK, I'll tell you about it. Uh, to bring together the considerable talent that's in this room, that we ensure that palliative care receive its fair share of government funding. I think as we talk, we need to think of ways to increase workforce capacity, to increase public awareness of the need and benefits of research, to refocus and to put an end to gatekeeping. And to engage with funding bodies who will help us move our agenda forward. I think that we have the ability to take what we've learned and put it into practice. And when we do, we will achieve excellence in palliative care. Thank you.